Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, we're very excited to be here today to talk about this very important topic of integrating security in Agile projects. As you know, this topic is discussed nowadays in every security and Agile conference all over the world. So why are we still standing here before you today, returning to this very important topic? Uh, that is a great question, Fred. Uh, why are we returning to the topic again and again? Uh, I think it's because even we all understand the importance of agile development and the importance of secure development for many years, we still see people who say uh, security is slowing down fast run of agile team. Or we see people who say security is stopping the delivery train of agile project. Is this really true? Can we say that security and agility looks like uh, oil and water and cannot be mixed smoothly? So we say no. We think security and agile development are actually partners. And if they work together, understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses, define common goals, and support each other in daily activities, it can be done. They can be a winning team. And uh, who we are and why we are standing to today on this stage. First of all, to increase the amount of women speaker on our conference, it's obviously. Uh, secondly, we just cannot miss the opportunity to visit such beautiful city and meet so nice people. Uh, but most seriously, because we believe we have a lot of uh, relevant experience since we are working on this uh, project, which integrating security with agile development for more than three years from now. So Elena represents the security part of the project. She brings yeah, right. vast experience in both the software development and security worlds. Uh, she knows the software development world from the inside as she went through various roles, starting from software developer, technical lead, system architect, and finally for the four last years as application security lead in our company. And Tefrat is representing the development side of the project as a senior project manager in one of our products, Stormrunner Load, which developed in Agile methodology. She brings deep knowledge and vast experience in both software development and project management. The red star there uh, represents a proper disclosure. As Elena and I represented our work last year in two other uh, very interesting conferences, uh, I was snatched. And now I'm uh, working in a completely different company, so it turns out life is agile too. Uh, so this is to let you know that today I'm a product manager at Intel, but for this talk today, I, re I will resume my project management role at HPE, and I'll tell you about uh, what we have achieved together. So what we are going to talk about today. First of all, what we are not going to talk, uh, as you see, we are all on SecDev Ops track. We will not talk about Ops. We will talk about on Sec and Dev. And also, we will not drill down on theoretical aspect of agile development or secure development, because we believe there, is, there are a lot of books, sites, uh, other materials which you can study by your own. Obviously, you will, we will uh, answer all your questions during the session if you have. But we will concentrate mostly on the practical aspects of integrating security and agile projects. We touch the challenges we met in uh, our experience. We will describe self, uh, secure lifecycle management framework we developed and used in our organization in last years and agile practices we adopted. Then we'll tell you how all this fits into planning and coordinating an agile development lifecycle of a new SaaS-based product with emphasis on roles and main activities. And during that, we will give you uh, practical tips and recommendations to take home with you. So before we will drill down on the practical aspect of integrating security in Agile projects, I want to provide you some background about our organization. As you possibly know, HP Software is a big global organization built from many different departments. The department which I responsible on as a security lead contain a portfolio from, uh, built from uh, 12 products most of them known on the market for a decade, and uh, the products developed and supported by more than 100 uh, employees located in five countries. As you understand, such big organization has a lot of policies, processes, and requirements which we have to be complying with, and this is one of the first challenges we met. And when we started our security program, first of all, I have to say we already shifted left because, because our security and trust office is a part of R&D organization and not IT organization as usually a security department located. So we started to work with our R&D 
and implement this SLM framework. Uh, you possibly know similar um, uh, frameworks provided by Microsoft, Oracle, or other big vendors. You can adopt them as is, or make as uh, we did, uh, just uh, build your own, adjust the uh, existing practices to your reality. So what the framework provides us? The framework provides us possibility to embed security activities on proper development stage uh, and ensure that you mitigate, that you found the risk and mitigate it prior release. And um, we started uh, from uh, big, well-established products, which coincidentally uh, had a very long uh, development cycle. And we built this very nice framework you see on the gray background, the uh, security activity, security plan, threat modeling, etc. cetera. Uh, VS uh, blue background uh, development stages. And in Fatterfall, it was just great. And we decided to adopt it and expand to another product. And for our surprise, we realized the uh, new next generation has come. So what new generation is Anena talking about? I'll tell you a little bit about my product so you understand why it is referred to as the new generation. So first of all, our product is a cloud-based performance testing tool. We have five development teams, total of 50 engineers. Uh, we are the most fastest group on site. We issue six versions a year. That's a version, full version every two months, productized, tested, documented, packaged version with at least five features, five new features each, and a bunch of bug fixes. We're sus based This means we need to respond very fast to the field. Um, this means we are much more connected to the customers than we were before. The simplicity, the flexibility, and the pace uh, that we need uh, in order to uh, issue formal com and communicate six versions a year alongside with hot fixes on the fly is very, very crucial. SAS means that we're no longer, you know, hardware maintenance, hardware, heavy installations at customer's site. Uh, the service, uh, the software is pro it provided as a service and can be purchased online, online with, via credit card or via salespeople. Uh, our product is very smart, simple, and scalable, and this is because it is targeting high-end developers and performance engineers, and it is easy to use and suitable for project develop, agile project life cycles. Um, the project is branded, the product is branded and marketed for agile life cycles, and this is why we also managed and developed it in the agile methodology. Last but not least, as you can understand, we are some kind of a startup group in the big corporation, but we're still obligated to policies and regulations, uh, one of them being security, which is the basis for our presentation today. Other collaborations that we have uh, start from feature integrations with other development groups, go through uh, integrations with performance groups, SaaS operators, documentation and technical writers. So as you can see, this is quite a complicated task. And the balance between the rabbit, which is us, and the turtle, which is the big corporation, has become our day-to-day -day lives. So how did we do it? Uh, when coming to uh, implement Agile in our organization, we did what everybody does. We read the book. Great. So what now? So very quickly, we understood that life is more complicated than a book, and there are many flavors and colors. So we decided to be creative, work with what we have, and this gave birth to an Agile flavor. So there's some stuff we did that were by the book and some stuff that we didn't do by the book. Can you maybe give me some examples of uh, any Agile classic attributes you would do? Something up of your head? Scrum teams? Great, what else? Sprints, nice. What else? User stories. Okay, that's the entity of their content. Uh, what would you? What do you think you can avoid? Backlog. Sorry. <laughs> Backlog. Backlog. <laughs> okay, you're you're the opposite. You're you're giving opposite examples. That's very interesting. What else can you avoid? What do you think is really really you know administrative and estimates? Nice. Okay, so that's a good point. The estimates. We didn't touch that. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what we did by the book and what we didn't do by the book. So first of all, the ceremonies. We had your classic agile ceremonies, you know, the pre-planning, the planning, the retrospective, the demo, and stuff, the daily. 
Uh, we also stuck to a minimal shippable product. Some of you may know this as the minimal viable product. We had a prioritized backlog, uh, ready for implementation at all time, but we did let ourselves be flexible with it according to customer feedback. We also had a strict heartbeat. Someone here said sprints, so hold that thought, strict heartbeat. And we also had a tool for project management, uh, tracking and monitoring, I'm sorry. Uh, as you know, Rally, Jira, and stuff. And we also had high automation coverage rate, uh, which is very important in Agile. It enabled us to test only the gaps and thus move faster. What we didn't do and what we recommend in our flavor. So first of all, we did not have sprints. We did have one heartbeat, as I said, but that heartbeat was one release. One release, I remind you, was every two months. And we didn't have sprints. We did have heartbeat, strict heartbeat checkpoints every week dressed up as status meetings. Now, why did we do this? We did it because uh, in every project management tool, as you know, there's the administrative toll of moving between sprints. If you don't make it on time for a certain user story, you need to go split and break and move in order to calculate the capacity versus the velocity. The teams hate it. So what we found is that they're much more obligated if we do like these uh, demi sort of semi sprints we, when we have the status checkpoints every week, but we don't call them sprints. In the administrative tool, in the project management tool, the whole release is one sprint. Uh, what else didn't we do by the book? Uh, we didn't have your classical full stack scrum teams because we had a lot of core teams, one of the most security, we had back end, we had front end, we had a lot of integrations with other teams. So they didn't want to break, uh, they don't want to merge the teams into one scrum team self-contained. Uh, they prefer to stay in their core teams. So we worked with that and you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, the other thing uh, we didn't have, if we didn't have the original Scrum teams, uh, we had uh, a feature leader. Feature leader is something that we compromise with. It's not a Scrum master, as we didn't have the Scrum teams, because we, we did have kind of feature teams. People from the various teams would work together for a certain feature, but only for that feature. They weren't there for the whole release. So there's, this wasn't a classical Scrum team. It was a feature team. So we had something we called a feature leader. In addition, we were shy and we added some ceremonies to your classic Agile ceremonies. I'll tell you about them in a moment. And also in the project management tool, we made sure to benefit from it and we added some cl unclassical configurations fields uh, that I'll show you about, that I'll show you also in a minute. So as you can see, we discovered that this flavor enabled us to integrate and collaborate with the many teams I told you about before and specifically for today with security. And we have the privilege to study the Agile methodologies together with development team from the beginning. And we understood we have to adjust our SLM to be aligned with new uh, reality. And um, you know, the simplest way is that Microsoft do, uh, they have a separate SDL SDLC for Agile development. They have two frameworks. Uh, we have framework already just with all our corporate policies and requirements. So we weren't so flexible and we needed to react fast. Uh, so we started to take a look in the sense of every activity and don't kill me Agile Guru who is possibly sitting in this room now. We understand the sense of the activity is the same. It's the same planning, it's the same development, it's the same release. But in Agile uh, reality it's going faster, shorter and more frequently. So we took our exactly same uh, framework. You see this exactly the same slide as you see before. But we started to perform the same activities, more frequent, interactively, iteratively, and with very fast feedback. And all these activities done by uh, external security governance team and development team together. At this point, you maybe ask yourself why we still need the external security governance team. If we know in Agile books, uh, every team is supposed to be self-contained and keep all knowledge inside the team and provide all experience from the, uh, inside the team. Uh, this is not secret. Without disregarding the development uh, organization, I came from this development organization. It's very professional. Uh, but we still know that application security is pretty new discipline. And uh, penetration testing is not common knowledge in development organization and QA organization. So we're providing this expertise to development team. 
Even we provide a lot of courses for our organization, secure coding, secure design, ethical hacking. Still, we see that uh, developers are not mature enough to make proper security decisions. So what we did, we defined the security checkpoints in the development process. We have checkpoints where we meet uh, together and see the security activity done by this checkpoint. Uh, this is only examples. This is not all checkpoints we have in our process, but the most important uh, three uh, presented here. First of all, we're doing content review. Content review, we perform a security impact labeling for uh, a new content supposed to be developed in this release. We will elaborate on the next slide about security impact. Design review, this is kind of uh, threat modeling, um, lightweight threat modeling, feature-based threat modeling. We will not uh, drill down on this because this is so huge uh, topic which requires own session to cover it. And uh, one, uh, last not least, uh, the security assessment. This is uh, manual penetration testing. Because we still see these requirements to run manual penetration testing, uh, even with all automation tool, uh, it can be replaced for now. So uh, let's talk about security impact. It's very, very critical part of our process. Uh, it can be done on any content level, theme, epic, feature, or even a separate user story. From our experience, we tried user stories. We don't recommend this if maybe you have a lot of spare time. Uh, feature is the most convenient uh, content unit in our case. Uh, what you need to define the security impact? First of all, you need to know the product. You need to know all security controls already implemented in this product. And you also need to understand what data managed by the product, what type of the data. And also you need to uh, ask more questions. Uh, for example, if uh, I see in backlog feature called uh, upgrade secure communication channel to support TLS 1.2 by default, it's obvious. Everyone can say this feature has high security impact since it's touch basic security control. But if I see a feature which uh, called uh, generate new report, do someone think that a feature generate new report has security impact? Yes? Do someone think that it doesn't have any security impact? Nobody? Strange. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I say I don't know. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. I need to ask feature lead additional questions. First of all, what security controls affected by this feature or vice versa affect the feature? For example, if this report visible to everyone or only to authenticated user or only even worse, only for admin of this uh, application. What data type represents this report? Is this uh, page hits the count statistics, or it may be a list of all client IPs who logged into your application in the last months. And most interesting, what new risk can be inserted in your application after the feature would be done? I suggest to you uh, use OWASP top 10 for risk analysis. Obviously, I don't need to present the OWASP or OWASP top 10 on this forum. Just for reference, please see the definition and the project location. So to continue our exercise, let's take a look on the latest published edition of uh, OWASP Top 10. I know it's, uh, we have 2017, but it's not published yet. It's a release candidate. So we are still using this one. And um, let's take the simplest one, but making so many problems to our developers and our customers using uh, components with known vulnerabilities. In order to continue our, our exercise, let's ask our feature lead. Dear feature lead, are you going to insert new library to generate the report? What library? What version? Does the library has known CVE? Do you have mitigation plan for this CVE? Continue this exercise, it's very useful and, uh, and even interesting. So we're doing this not just for fun, 
We have very valuable outcome from this checkpoint. We have security impact defined for every feature for upcoming release. And what we gain from this? We have a complete security picture of upcoming release. We have very detailed documentation of all our concerns and decisions. We create list of features for next checkpoint for design review. And we build prioritized backlog for security assessment. Security assessment, as I mentioned before, as this is a stage we are performing penetration testing. We have own flavor of penetration testing, as you understand, we really like flavors. And obviously our tester should think as an attacker, but uh, she or he need also to know the product as a developer. We selected the white box approach because we are working in very, very strict time limit. As Efrat mentioned, we have very strict heartbeat and we don't want to stop this heart. And uh, test run is in controlled environment to ensure we are validating proper scope. And all this done together with full support of development team. So what support do we give the security team? So everything Elena just talked about, the SNM, the penetration test, the security impact, the content review, everything. How did we embed this uh, into our processes? So we wanted to make the security an inseparable part of our project life cycle. So we made, made sure to embed the security elements in every important checkpoint. So we'll give you some examples. The timeline. Every timeline I would create for every release six times a year, I would make sure we had a penetration uh, security slot for every, every release. I would send this to all the team. Everyone knew when it happened. In addition to that, uh, our project purchased a dedicated environment. This is extra cost, but we really recommend it. I want to emphasize this point. Uh, this dedicated environment was a controlled environment. It didn't have any temporary dirty DLLs, so it was in configuration uh, as similar to production as possible. Uh, also, it didn't have any debugging tools like any other environment of ours. And also, uh, it was dedicated to security team, right? So they were independent to come in and out to test and retest whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted it. In addition, a very important point, it's not, it's not the similar environment that the QA tested on. You know, the QA teams like to test high availability and disconnections, and that affects the availability and, the, and stability of the environment. So this is another reason why we separated the environments. So very recommended if you can afford it. In the planning process, so we set a timeline, we had an environment. In the planning process, we made sure we had what we called a security bucket. This is dedicated capacity of the dev, dev team to uh, respond to any issues uh, in security that we found or solve any security defects from the former release. Um, in the uh, uh, security area, of course, we have a secure cre security criteria, as you might know, a security level, a security grade, every company has one. So we made sure that was part of the release criteria. And if they weren't both green, we didn't go live. Another thing is the uh, status and res retrospective. Uh, the status meeting, as I told you, was done as a checkpoint every week. Uh, the security was part of that meeting. In the slide, we had a dedicated place for the security. So uh, this let us engage the group leader and the team leaders uh, in the security uh, risks and status. So they weren't you know, agnostic to this. They weren't uh, detached from this. And they knew exactly what was, what was happening and weren't neglecting security. And the project ceremonies. So we made sure Elena here uh, joined us in the agile project ceremonies, specifically the retrospective and the planning, which were the most important ones that we invited security to. But in addition, uh, we added two dedicated ceremonies to these agile ceremonies that were dedicated to security. So the first ceremony we added was a bi-weekly pre-scheduled, predefined, embedded uh, uh, ceremony in our calendars. This was the ceremony was a platform for us to sync and speak and meet and make sure we have time to discuss all the SNM stages that Elena told you about. So we embedded it in our process. How do we do the content review? When do we do it? So we have this bi-weekly meeting and uh, it had uh, uh, dynamic content. 
once, if it was the beginning of the release, uh, we would talk about the content, we would review all the features, and decide together about the security impact. Uh, if there was a feature that we needed a more technical deep dive in, and we wanted to review the architecture, we did these design reviews Elena told you about in this meeting. If we needed to, uh, if it was the end of the penetration tests, and we needed to review the bugs that were opened, uh, review the security, see if something was missing, logs, screenshots, uh, assign the, the defects, something wasn't clear enough, uh, we would use this meeting. So this is really a platform for you to communicate and make sure you have all the checkpoints, all the SLM checkpoints inside your process. And we enlarge the Agile ceremonies for this. The other ceremony we did, by the way, also in this time slot of the bi-weekly ceremony, security ceremony, was a dedicated demo. Um, this was in addition to the demo, the classical demo, the team demo that you know from Agile. Uh, we understood that in order to give the penetration uh, testers the tools to know the product as a developer, it was our responsibility to walk them through the product and give them the right context every release. So both of these were done iteratively every release. So that was the processes and the ceremonies. What were the tools we, we used in order to make sure that everything we did together was also audited? So there were many tools, but the most important tool was the project management tool that we made sure was uh, uh, worked for us and not us for the tool, as we all know happens sometimes. Uh, so first of all, we made it a rule that all the security content was audited in our project management tool. So same tracking tool. We said that security is part of the project as not, and not an external task. Everything was audited, bugs, user stories, action items, comments, whatever. Uh, the additional configurations in the, in the sprint, you remember in the flavor I told you additional ceremonies, so we talked about that. I told you we have additional, additional configuration fields. So what did we have? Uh, for security, for example, we made sure that the security issues had this special little prefix, the security with uh, brackets. Uh, this enabled us to count, filter, and find specifically the security issues in our project management tool among all the issues from the project. We also could use this filter in certain widgets and graphs. So this is very useful. In addition, we added two fields, security impact and security comments. Of course, we needed to audit everything that happened in that ceremony that we added. If it was a content review and we needed to decide on security impact, is it critical, is it high, how do we remember? So we had this field in order to audit it. And of course, the security comments were used for any action items we had from the content reviews or the design reviews, any action items or something we wanted to remember. We also uh, invented the security defect template because we realized that security defects are different than regular defects. And specifically here, because of the penetration testers came one step after the development, we sometimes saw that uh, when the defect is fixed, they need information about the defect. Uh, they need the fixed characteristics, they need the code reference maybe, uh, and other stuff. So, this is just to visualize, I'll show you. This is like a timeline, you know, the regular Visio timeline I did. And here's that we also have the penetration test slot that I told you I have every release. This is a screenshot from our project management tool. You see we have the release name and the feature and everything. And we also have the security impact field, field which is classif classified with critical, high, low, medium, etc., or it needs design review, DR. And you see the security comments field is, of course, a free text field. Uh, this is a partial screenshot, of course, and we would use that to insert any comments and audit any action item. The defect template, as you can see, we inserted a, a embedded a, a table here so that the developer that fixed the security defect had to insert the fixed description and the comment ID. Again, for the penetration testers to know what to, to test. So uh, we talked about the processes, we talked about the tools, we talked about the ceremonies, and I want to tell you a little bit about the roles that we had in our group to make this dream come true. So from the security governance, of course, we had the penetration team and Elena, but that was external. What do we think you need in your uh, development groups in order to achieve this? So first of all, there's the security champion. 
This is a developer in our group. This is the person that comes to all these bi-weekly meetings and answers any technical uh, questions, uh, talks about any technical implementation risks and all the features, and it's just a technical focal point and a tactical technical fo focal point for things you need right here and now. He was also the one to work very closely with the penetration team. Uh, he was the one to retest the bugs for them sometimes, to show them uh, where, where things are, are written. He was the code referee. He was also the technical demonstrator. And we like to call him sort of a double agent for both the security and the development team. We also had uh, the architect, that's our system architect from our group. Uh, this was more than a the, this was more of a strategic uh, focal point. The system architect did not come to all the biweekly meetings, but did come to all the design reviews. Even led the design reviews of the specific specific features. As you remember, a design review is something like a threat model, but feature based. Uh, the reason for this is that the architect knows the big picture and could make sure that the security requirements are embedded into the product strategy, roadmap, and architecture but with balance, that the security requirements will not impact the product too much. And finally, last but not least, the project manager, that's me. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, we think that the project manager is the main orchestrator in all of this. Uh, the project manager is responsible to embed the joint process that I told you about in both security and development teams. The project manager is responsible to schedule and manage and audit and follow up the execution. Uh, he's the one or she's the one to raise the sense of uh, urgency, security-wise, of course. And we really think that the project manager is the spine of it all and mostly for continuous improvement to make sure that the security level rises up each release. Okay, um, after Frat successfully advertised role of PMO on a couple of conferences we had in Israel, she was taken by Intel from us. And we also want you all to uh, take something useful home. But not me. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to provide you some uh, tips you can take home and implement in your organization. So first of all, know your partner. Know each other's limits, know each other's tools, know each other's timelines, know each other's people. Talk to each other, get to know each other. We don't say stop reading the books, continue to read books, continue to study, but uh, adjust the theory to your practical life. Cooperate and back up each other. You know, Elena and I used to talk so much, we got bored with each other. But that way, nothing falls between the chairs, you know. So if I like uh, neglected to see a mail, then she would back me up and vice versa, stuff like that. Work interactively, retrospect, study from your failures and successes. So communication, communication, communication. Meet and think periodically. Uh, if it's either via calendar invites that I told you about or coffee tests, which is another agile ceremony. Use to keep all your important decisions audited. Promote and formalize yourselves. Tell everyone about what you're doing, brand yourselves and what you're doing, and make it a standard in your organization. And finally, don't say security doesn't work with Agile. Adjust yourself, be flexible, find a good partner, and you will succeed together. Thank you. So we'll be happy to answer any questions, yeah? Uh, and you can also contact us via LinkedIn and mails, and of course in the conference breaks. Any questions? Yes. How many people who work in your security environment support these 400 developers? So it's the uh, two in, different things. In Security Trust Office, we have a security lead per business unit, and uh, penetration lab, which uh, constantly rotating about three or four. Uh, testing teams uh, assigned to uh, validation, a couple of architects, response managers, uh, about 10 people, uh, I believe, besides penetration testing. So this is... So this is why we needed, uh, my group is one of the 400, one group in all the 400, so this is why we always needed to schedule with yeah. security, because they don't always have time. But for, for, for this 400, I, I'm only security lead. I'm responsible for this 400. 
And uh, she meditation works 24 hours a day. I, uh, yes, I receive help from my uh, organization for separate tasks. Yes. Uh, it's hard to say. I know uh, we have a couple of generation of penetration testers really for these four years. Uh, the first generation came as a, a consulting attitude, as you know. It was uh, not very suitable to work with uh, product security, but now they started to work with developers very close. Uh, almost of them have some background in the development, some knowledge in programming languages. Uh, they developed some tools to uh, run some first glance uh, uh, scrolling on tool to find possible weaknesses. That is some kind of homegrown tools. And also they use using Nessus, if you know infrastructure scanner to find all uh, related to hardening problems and configuration problems. And, um, of course they have the demo. Yeah. And uh, they receive uh, every uh, two months, they have a deep Training. session about uh, product, of, about new content and product. Yeah. What did you do with the Ah, it's, it's very interesting. We don't have classical report, really. Uh, first of all, uh, because we are working on very strict timelines and we find uh, some critical issue, even not properly documented yet, they catch the security champions, they sit together and uh, study the issue. At the end, we provide some kind of lightweight report which are uh, directly imported to the uh, system where a fraud manager the content. The project actually. management tool. We have all defects inside the product tool. Of course. Of course. No, no, uh, no. We, have, we have very strict re release criteria. Why we are uh, trying to catch the critical issues uh, even before it's documented? Because in some places, uh, people fix the issue on place. They don't check in on the t same night. So this is what I told you about. The security uh, criteria is part of the project criteria. It can block a release, yes. And also the penetration test reports was reviewed in these ceremonies. This is why we had them every two weeks. And of course, as I told, meet and sync also in coffee tests. We used to talk all the time. Nothing was neglected. If we had a critical bug, we would fix it. And also, if things were not too critical, we would uh, do them in the next, next release. This is why I emphasize that in every planning, we had the security bucket capacity for saved for the uh, development team to solve any security issues and not say, you know, we don't have time, we're doing new features, we don't have time for security. That didn't happen. What is great in agile methodology from the security point of view is that people say it's a nightmare, but it's good. You have release every two months. You find something critical, you can provide some fast and dirty solution and you get a proper fix next release. But you have so to plan ahead. ahead. <laughs> yes. Um, you said that you review them every, in the bi weekly meetings, you review the pandas. So does that mean that you're doing continuous pandas every two, like for two week segments, or is it like one continuous two month one? Or how, what's the length of those pandas? Um, it's not exactly, we, we have bi weekly meeting which has the dynamic content. One of and them. This reading, one of the things we are doing, this is if it's a cycle of penetration finished, we are reviewing the penetration test. But next week we might be discuss content, new content. For example, uh, some features were added or discoped or moved to next release. Uh, next meeting we might discuss uh, fixes for previous release of defects, which uh, uh, supposed to fix in this iteration. Uh, next meeting, we can run design reviews, uh, feature-based threat modeling, so it's... Uh, penetration testing, it's once about... Once in two months. Two months. Once in two months, every yes. release. Every release, once in two months. So does that mean you have an in-house team that's doing continuous pen testing? No, we don't have continuous. Oh, once it's, in one release. Yes, once a release, but uh, we have constant communication, so fixes uh, come in ongoing. During penetration test, we receive fixes sometimes. So is it better than getting them so that you can constantly adapt and add those later on? 
No, no, it's not in the beginning. It's uh, it's very close to the feature freeze, something like that. You know, to the end. Of, then we have the penetration testing, and we work very closely. This is why we have the security champion. If we find something, we try to immediately fix it. And stuff that is not very critical moves to the next release. And then in the beginning of re the release, we also uh, fix these security issues. So we interact with the pen test all the time. But the penetration test period is that time slot I showed you. Uh, very close to the end of the uh, features development. But if you're doing an uh, entire CLC, as SLM in our case, you're doing design review, you're doing content review, uh, this is our dream and we really pretty close. We want to have the penetration test with zero finding something. Yes. And we're pretty close to this. Yes. So that's a great question. Um, I can tell you that we're uh, recently trying the one month approach and uh, we're very close to succeeding. So I think one month would be, would be I good. I can say that we have already two products, but just not, yeah. I know because it's my domain. It's other products, it's not a front product. Uh, already delivering every month and uh, we succeeded to work with them. And uh, again, I say, uh, in, this case, agile, uh, in this case, Agile methodology is uh, very good because we see constant improvement and uh, people awareness is growing and people starting to fix defects by themselves with the, without talking to me. So the, 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 the training go, uh, takes off also, and they're, they're, we feel that the security uh, starts to be part of them. So they're not just waiting for Elena anymore. They're, they're doing it. They know the importance, as Elena said, the awareness. And I think one month will be the fastest. I, I'm not sure that you know every two weeks uh, we, no, can, we can't insert the security elements. I'm not sure that it is needed. M maybe month. it's possible, but currently, from our experience, the past at least one, once a, uh, a month. Yes. Thank you.